Welcome into the Talking Tide podcast once again on the Belly Up Podcast Network. I'm Chase Goodbread, sports columnist with the Tuscaloosa News, joined by Travis Ryder, the longtime senior analyst at BamaOnline.com. You can get the Talking Tide podcast anywhere you like to get them, Apple Podcasts and anywhere else. We are live on YouTube and Facebook as well. And the Twitter feed is Talking underscore Tide. You can get links to all of our podcasts right there just as soon as they drop. So give us a follow there. Give us a like and a subscribe on Facebook and YouTube as well. We want to thank Peterbrook Chocolatier of Tuscaloosa, our fine sponsor. Got a little sponsorship news uh, in the works. We're not quite ready to spring yet, but uh, soon enough we'll have more for you on that. And soon enough we'll have more Alabama football, at least some Alabama football that we can see, Travis. But uh, – Saturday, the Crimson Tide took to Bryant-Denny Stadium and uh, scrimmage for the first time of fall camp. But, of course, as always, that fall uh, first scrimmage closed to media. A um, little bit of a little bit of chatter has fallen out of it. Apparently a solid day for Jalen Milrow, which uh, certainly I know Alabama fans would be glad to know. Jermaine Burton, uh, a guy who apparently performed pretty well as well, uh, Context always difficult, though, Travis, because uh, beyond uh, what you hear, all you get to go on is a Nick Saban press conference, which I thought was pretty revealing, frankly, uh, went about 10 minutes uh, late in the afternoon on Saturday. Uh, but uh, uh, next week's scrimmage and uh, in, Intel will probably be a bit easier to, to, to get our get our mitts on. Yeah, context is king, and unfortunately, as is typically the case, especially with this first scrimmage of fall camp, it's difficult to paint that picture for you. Is it ones versus twos in some situations? Is it goal line work? Uh, is it red zone? Is it two-minute, four-minute offense? There's a lot of different situations that are incorporated into these scrimmages. But, yeah, as far as a overriding theme, starting with the quarterback situation, if those guys went into it, Milrow, Simpson, and Buckner on Saturday, between what you've heard or I've heard or the buzz that's been out of there uh, since Saturday, doesn't sound like that's changed all that much, Chase. No, no, it doesn't. And, and the quarterback question is, is, is certainly one that, that fans have top of mind and will uh, probably not only going into week one, but maybe coming out of week one as well. As for Nick Saban's comments, Travis, I heard and, and saw uh, just, you know, being in the room, uh, an edge of intensity in Saban, Travis, that, that never devolved into a rant of any sorts or, or anything that would go viral or anything like that. But he came off that practice field hot. I don't think there's any question. I, I don't think he was thrilled with what he saw overall, just in general terms. Um, was quick to mention uh, some drops by wide receivers, some more difficulty with penalties as well. And those are two areas where Alabama fans are, are used to seeing problems, at least have been used to it for the last year or so. Uh, so, you know, those are certainly – and, and physicality, it sounds like he's looking for uh, uh, a little bit more brute strength on that line of scrimmage as well. Although, as, as Saban did – point out in the news conference this is only the third time they've been in full pads and so uh it it, it could take a little time to get acclimated and and uh maybe get the uh the physicality that you want out of everybody who's going to be playing a big role on the team uh i think uh the scrimmage or excuse me the practice immediately before the scrimmage i, I think as you noted in a in a watch along on on three um, they were they weren't in shoulder pads, uh, just uh, helmets out there, and uh, uh, more of a walkthrough really before a scrimmage, which is to be expected. It is. That's pretty much what you're going to see on the eve of a scrimmage. But yeah, and look, had we mentioned that it's a thousand degrees at twelve thirty one o'clock when they get this thing going at yes. Ryan Denny Stadium, so you know, as is usually the case for Nick in that situation, he's looking as much at can you sustain in those type of conditions when they are just absolutely at their worst. And that was the case also on Saturday afternoon. He, he obviously likes that. He wants to bring all of these things together 
and be able to get the most thorough evaluation he can of each individual on that roster. So no doubt consistency or a lack of it, still a continuing theme. Uh, seems like he in the spring tried to take more of a positive approach about the drops in the eight day game, because we all saw them back in April. Uh, but it doesn't sound like he's taking that same approach. And if the conditions uh, are exactly as miserable as, as they seem to be this time of year, he doesn't want to hear that either, you know, because he knows, he knows the metal that's required to do what six of his teams have done at Alabama. And this is when you develop that. And if he's not getting enough guys that are pushing through to the other side and maintaining that high level of play throughout, uh, he's probably going to, he's probably going to make that known when he's given the opportunity publicly. I think it's probably fair to point out too, that the wide receivers as a group are probably getting a little bit too much of the brunt uh, from the drops from last season. Alabama uh, dropped 23 balls last season, Travis. They weren't all by wide receivers, right? Uh, Tight ends had their share. There were a couple of drops by the backs. I think Gibbs had a Amir big one Gibbs against Tennessee. Had a huge drop against Tennessee that, that, that yeah. would have maybe season defining third down. Yeah. yeah. So um, it's not all on the wide receivers when the catches don't get made, but certainly the, the receiver drops are the ones that stand out more for a couple of reasons. One, you expect them to make better catches and tougher catches because that's that's all they do as opposed to a running back and a tight end whose job is a little more diversified. Um, but, you know, at the same time, uh, it, it drops can come from anywhere. The wide receivers also, they're going to be running the deeper routes. They're going to, it's going to tend to be more costly when a wide receiver drops a ball, uh, but not always. Yeah. And I took it kind of the other way too. The fact that he wasn't happy about drops told me the quarterbacks must have been pretty good. They must have been putting the ball on the receivers, which right. if you went into Saturday scrimmage with a bigger concern, quarterback or receiver, I'm pretty sure it was quarterback. So there's a glass, ha glass half full side of that too. Um, you know, it seemed like the quarterbacks in general were spared uh, Saban's pep talk, I guess you could call it, following Saturday scrimmage. Must have been an okay day for Milrow and the rest of those guys. Versatility in the secondary also came up in that news conference, Travis. Uh, Saban making quick mention of uh, Malachi Moore's ability to move around in the secondary, Terry and Arnold. Uh, Kool-Aid McKinstry was at the top of his list as well, even though we haven't seen him all over the place like in games like we have, for instance, Malachi Moore. Uh, but but sounds like he's comfortable moving him around if necessary. Uh, Jalen Key, uh Another one, Saban mentioned, that can move around. What I thought was interesting about those comments, Travis, though, is that, you know, he likes to be able to move guys around back there, certainly in case of injury during the season. You want guys to know uh, more than one job in case injuries or what have you necessitate a shuffle. Uh, but it's not just about that. It's also about knowing – where your help is and when your help's coming and what to expect from your help, right? So if you're Terry and Arnold and most of your experience is playing that outside corner position, well, if you, if you get learned well at the nickel spot, that not only bodes well if you have to play it, it also bodes well because you understand in coverage what you can get and what you can't get from help from that position and other positions, safety, whatever the case may be. And Nick Saban uh, made a curious comparison, I thought, between the secondary and the offensive line, right, being similar. He said you need versatility on the offensive line as well as the secondary. And I think for some of the same reasons, right, because you want a swing guy on that offensive line who can move around in case a guy gets hurt. But it's also good to cross train because you have a better sense of what to expect from your teammate. Yeah, it's also about like the offensive line. You're still trying to find your best five. You know, you're a nickel oriented defense these days. You're not playing base defense. You're not just two corners and two safeties. You're five, six defensive backs more than your four. So there are some X factors in that secondary. Terry and Arnold, if he in fact is 
a guy that you can slide inside the star. And especially if Trey Amos is playing at the level you think he's playing at right now, coming in from Louisiana at the corner, you know, that maybe is part of your best five. Terry and Arnold at star with Trey Amos at corner. And also, um, of course, Kool-Aid at corner. And then, you know, you've got versatility. you got some things you can do down by down at safety. Devontae Smith, one of the storylines of this fall camp to this point. Hey, great. If he wins a job, especially in the nickel and dime, more power to him. Uh, but if he does, that means a guy like if Terry and Arnold's at star and Devontae Smith's at safety, Malachi Moore then is a little bit in flux. I'm not saying that's going to be the case. I'd be surprised if it ends up working out that way. But it just speaks to the variety of options that you just outlined that Saban would like to have, not just in terms of safety and corner, but how both those positions impact the nickel and the dime rolls at star and money. Depth on the line of scrimmage also came up. Saban uh, across two news conferences this week commented uh, that both the OL and the DL have six or seven guys he's fairly comfortable with, but he's looking for more. He's obviously looking for a full two deep on both sides that, that, that he's comfortable with. And, uh, you know, I guess if you got six or seven guys on the DL that you're happy with, you're pretty close to that. If you've only got six on the OL, you're not. Um, especially when, uh, you know, especially when the, you know, the base look is, is, is a three, four, um, like you said, it's, it's a nickel almost full time anyway, unless you're in the dime, but, uh, Justin, a boy be drew some praise. Jaheim Otis drew some praise from Saban, uh, following the scrimmage, Tim Smith, he says up and down and Tim Smith's a guy he, he's, uh, Travis, I almost put Tim Smith in a similar bucket with Chris Braswell, in terms of this being the year for the breakout, kind of out of time right now if you're, if you're Tim Smith. Um, both of those guys presumably are going to see quite a bit of action uh, this fall, uh, but in terms of production and being able to, be, being able to uh, deliver down after down uh, for Braswell, that would include early downs for Tim Smith. Maybe that includes third down, uh, but uh, something to watch with those two for sure. Alabama looking for uh, significantly more production from from both of those guys this fall. No doubt. And with Smith and Braswell, you said it, sort of that crossroads year for both of them. Um, You know, Smith's interesting because if he isn't going to be a every down guy or that sort of participant in the rotation to go along with a Boygby, who I think a Boygby is going to span every package, end in the base, inside and nickel, or he can play that five technique end in a big nickel as well. Dime comes around. You can put him on the nose and use him as a pass rusher inside in that look. Uh, but for Smith, uh, if, if it isn't now, um, you start to think about, well, who, who else could it be? Because Nick said he feels like they've got five or six guys that are ready to play right now. Well, is Jamarian Latham one of those guys? Probably. Um, is Damon Payne one of those guys? Maybe that's the guy relative to Smith that is making perhaps more of a push. I think if Jaheim Otis is at the weight that he is, you could even play him at end in some big nickel and some base and play Tim Keenan with him. You know, I think there's some different scenarios that they can still consider, and I think that's probably what they're continuing to do. Yeah, there's no doubt. Uh, th- there's some options up front on both sides. Sounds to me like the OL and, and Nick Saban lamented a little inconsistency on the offensive line for the first scrimmage. Nevertheless, he's been pretty high on most of those guys across that offensive front. Uh, Terrence Ferguson, uh, he had some uh, very encouraging comments about his play earlier in the week. Um, Seth McLaughlin at the center position as well. Over at right tackle, Travis, this week we learned J.C. Latham's put a couple of pounds on, 360 on that Ooh. scale. Came, came the Growing Twitter boy. News. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, no doubt about it. That's a massive size, uh, which you can get away with a little bit more on the right side than the, in the left side, right? Well, and, so and that's kind of what it tells you. With him being he's on a the right, right tackle. Yeah, he's yeah. a right tackle at 360. I, I know there's some guys that can he's still do it on the right left tackle. side. Yeah, he's the he's the right tackle and the extra tackle that they like to bring in at times. 
uh, like Kendall Randolph, <laughs> you know, as a tight end. So yeah, he, that's a guy. I mean, if he is, in fact, Brandon Green. If if the if if that if that tweet was authentic, uh, yeah, uh-huh. that's a guy you're going to want to get behind. And then you got Tyler Booker over there on that right side. So I think if Alabama really needs it, Chase, uh, there's a good chance they're going to look to get behind those guys. And Terrence Ferguson, I've I go back to the spring game with him and watching that a few times over, I became more and more impressed with the job he did. I understand he was working with the twos against the twos, but uh, he did what a one should do against twos in that scrimmage. He was outstanding and sounds like his development has just continued on through the summer. And here he is on the cusp of nailing down that job at left guard. No doubt about it. Uh, And I think further on Latham, Travis, Fair to say he probably wouldn't have put that out there if that extra weight had just come from grandma cooking, right? Yeah. I mean, it, it, it must you be don't fine. tweet that yeah. out unless it's something that everybody in the program's on board with, right? That's big, though. 360. Wow. Yeah. I yes, mean, sir. like I said, uh, he, he has shown he can play at a at, at a big number. So uh, that may be, you know, the, the, like you said, one of the times where it's good news uh, rather than, oh, we got a guy we got to watch here. All the easier to notice if you jump off sides, that's for sure, at 300. And he needs pounds. to clean that up. Yeah, he had a few of those last year. I think he had 11 penalties last yeah. year and led the yeah. team, if I'm not yeah. mistaken. So, he did. Uh, definitely an area for him to improve on. Left tackle, the one spot that Nick Saban sounded as though this week uh, that, that uh, cake's still in the oven, kind of like the quarterback spot, <laughs> right? Uh, uh uh, Elijah Prichett and Caden Proctor, yeah. a couple of inexperienced guys, uh, but a couple of big, talented, and highly regarded recruits, certainly competing at that spot. Uh, but he's – Nick Saban's looking for looking for one of those guys to nail it down. I don't think there's much doubt. Oh, I, it, it seems to be centered on those because if it's not one of those, then who is it? I mean – I think Miles McVay has been out a little bit in camp, and uh, I think Will Conformby in time is going to be a starter caliber. Uh, Ola Salinan, we've seen probably more inside, certainly in the spring, than at tackle. So got to come from one of those two guys, and kind of feels like the longer this thing goes on, probably the better it is for Caden Proctor because he's the guy that should need more time. To get there and so if Pritchett doesn't nail it down or hasn't nailed it down that would seem to bode well uh, for Caden Proctor talking tide podcast on the belly up podcast network moving on Peter Brook chocolatier of Tuscaloosa our fine sponsor Travis tell us some about him I went by there again by the way a couple days ago grabbed a couple of those sea salt milk chocolate caramels those are getting to be my favorite I'm kind of gravitating toward those uh, when I pop into Peter Brook, but so much more available over there. Peter Brook Chocolatier, 1530 McFarland Boulevard North in the Indian Hills section of Tuscaloosa. Chase talked about it, man. I love those peanut butter meltaways too. Uh, when you talk about yes. the assortment pieces, uh, look, they, the they line up great. on the field right next to those sea salt caramels. They are, they are like a garden of tackle for you. Five star first teamers. Um, they're outstanding. You can't go wrong with any of the assortment pieces at Peterbrook, but uh, I could just do a full box of the meltaways, peanut butter meltaways myself. You can catch them at Peterbrook Chocolatier, 1530 McFarland Boulevard North in the Indian Hills section of Tuscaloosa. You got any questions, give them a call. 205-752-0211. Open Monday through Saturday, 10 a.m. to 8 p.m. Peterbrook Chocolatier, Tuscaloosa. All right. The Talking Tide podcast on the Belly Up Podcast Network, the Twitter feed, talking underscore tide. Going to knock it out here for just a few more minutes, Travis. By the way, uh, hats off to that classic old school USFL t shirt there. The Get Jacksonville it. Bulls, our hometown of Jayville, Florida, representing there. Uh, a fine logo. Wish the team oh, had been better. The colors, but a and fine the logo. Yeah, that logo. I mean, that's mid '80s logo. Good bread. I mean, that's a, that's Can't way ahead it. of its time, right? Absolutely. Always Can't a beat Jacksonville it. Bull. Yeah, no doubt. Our old friend Greg, Greg Larson told me that he, he once approached uh, the owner Fred Bubba Bullard 
and asked him if the name of the team, the Jacksonville Bulls, was nothing more than an ego in than an ego trip for his last name. He said Fred denied that. Uh -huh. Yeah. <laughs> there, well, I mean, when you think about USFL owners, there were no egos involved with those guys. <laughs> right. Chase. I mean, history has proven that there were yeah, no of egos. Not. No egos in that mix. None. Mm. A lot of fun, those Jacksonville Bulls, 1984 and 5, I believe, mm -hmm. uh, was the uh, the existence there. All right, Travis, before we get out of here, wanted to mention quickly uh, the names popping in on this annual fall camp guest speaker rotation that Nick Saban yeah. has going. Pete Rose, the hit king, Charlie Hustle, drops in on the football team. And then just a day or two later, Doc Rivers, NBA head coach, uh, recently let go by the Philadelphia 76ers in the house as well. Uh, who, who's next? I mean, gee, you want to talk about some people that, that can grab attention. I'd love to hear from Charlie Hustle, but I'd like to do it in a dimly lit bar in downtown Tuscaloosa, you know? <laughs> yeah. Get him maybe yeah. at the end of that corner of that bar at Heat Pizza in downtown Tuscaloosa, that one corner with the Paul Bear Bryant doing the X's and O's on the clear board up there in that corner where mm -hmm. we podcast from before. I'd like to get him down there and then be able to get the real goods out of Pete Rose, you know, the real stories, because uh, they would probably, uh, they would probably produce an audible gasp uh, if you were <laughs> able to do that. But you know what it gets me to think in two chase, why would you do anything if you're these people, you know, sports whatever background they come from then do this speaking tour in august I mean, every school does it now you talk about areas of football or program building that saban has been so innovative he, he kind of broke in this speaker thing too didn't he i mean it's what i first remember especially at the college level no doubt about it uh i'm curious though travis i'm gonna i'm gonna so every once in a while i ask you to give me an over under I want the over under on the number of Alabama players who really knew who Pete was before they heard his name on that on that speaker. Uh, that that total is oh. ha half zero point five. <laughs> That's your total <laughs> half a hook. It's been a while. One, since one Pete's hook. Had, Pete's been not involved. a number in a hook. A hook. That would be the total. Yeah. He's almost 35 years removed from being a manager, much less a player. I know. I, so you're right. It's, uh, but you know, you know, the, the only person in that meeting room that it matters to or matters who knows him, Nick Saban. If Nick wanted yeah. to hear Charlie he Hustle, Pete. guess what? Yeah. That, that could have just been for, no doubt for Nick. Yeah, Pete could give you some stories. There's no question oh. if you could get him to hang out in Tuscaloosa for a night. There's no Ooh. doubt about it. Yeah, I don't want I don't Although, want the video. I don't want the video in the team meeting room. I want the uh, interaction in Saban's office. You know, before that, right. I want to hear what they talked about. You know. Yeah, yeah, Pete. Uh, Pete's not afraid to come with some of those great stories in a public setting either, though. No. You know, he's a no. He's a fine storyteller. It's the clubhouse for Pete, no matter where he's at. Pete's always in the There's clubhouse. There's no doubt. I, yeah. I ran across, well, I'll be quick with this because we're off the Alabama football topic for sure, but I ran across <laughs> a video of Pete Rose telling a great story the other day. Um, I, was, I was in the middle of a YouTube rabbit hole and, and, and came across Pete uh, talking about his, his years, I think, with the Reds at that time. Uh, Pete, of course, uh, had a gal in every town when he would travel around uh, as one of the best players in Major League Baseball. They were in Houston, Travis, uh, playing the Astros. And uh, Pete said, if I recall correctly, I'm paraphrasing a lot of this, but he said he sent a rookie to the airport uh, to pick up uh, to pick up his girlfriend in, in Houston or whatever. And uh, he, he'd have he's having a girl flown into Houston for his stay over there. And the, the rookie goes, he he says, uh, uh, you know, but the kid doesn't know her, her name or anything. He says, Pete, how, how am I going to recognize who this is? Pete says, she'll be the best looking girl on the plane coming off. All right. So anyway, the rookie goes to the airport to uh, uh, to pick up this this girl for Pete. And uh, Rose said, 
like the fourth or fifth person off the plane was Farrah Fawcett. So the rookie walks up to Farrah Fawcett and says, hey, I'm here to pick you up for Pete Rose. He'll meet (laughs) you after the ball game. (laughs) And uh, uh, apparently uh, Farrah caught up with Pete years later and said, did you try to pick me up in Houston one time? It was uh, was a fantastic video. One time, Pete. There you go. Yeah, yeah. He's a, uh, you know, you talk about character. All right. How about that? Sports? Two- you know, that's uh, the, the, we don't have that really anymore. Uh, we got, we got no. incredible generational all time ta- talents uh, like Atani and these other guys, but the true characters of the game, we certainly don't have as much anymore. Yeah, no doubt about it. All right, Travis, uh, how about we dive into that two deep tumbler real quick before we get out of here and uh, see who comes out of it. I'm gonna give it a give it a spin here and see who comes out this time. And here we go. Number 11, it's a double number, Travis. That would be Christian Story, the defensive back, and Malik Benson at the wide receiver position. Of course, Benson, a junior college transfer uh, who Alabama is hoping can bolster that wide receiving core. Uh, Starting with Story, anyway, who we saw a good bit of uh, on A-Day. Your thoughts on on Story? Yeah, it looked like Christian, unfortunately, at the start of camp and into camp, uh, was dealing with a, a bit of a injury, uh, which couldn't come at a worse timing because he was certainly and is still in that mix uh, for that one safety spot. It looks like Caleb Downs is pretty much inserted at one. I think Malachi Moore you have to consider as another, but they need that third safety for the different packages. Devontae Smith apparently has taken advantage of that situation. You got Jalen Key in from UAB competing there as well. Um, so Christian's in a spot where um, it's tough because if you're not full go or you miss a chunk of practice to open camp uh, as a result of a physical limitation, that's just the worst timing that you could uh, possibly imagine. So uh, I think Christian's a veteran guy. He can certainly plug and play in some s- different situations. And um, I think special teams, you know, that's that's another area where you draw from his position and you would think he'd be in that mix too, right? You would, you would. Uh, Saban mentioned him as well when he was asked about versatility yesterday. He's another, yeah. who's an, another guy who can play yep. a couple of spots he for play the money. Tide. Yeah, could do that. Could do that. Not the biggest guy in the world, uh, for sure. But uh, he's a uh, he's somebody who could see definitely some action this fall. Travis, what about Malik Benson, the wide receiver, uh, who's Kind of come in with a lot of hype. One of the top junior college wide receivers in the country as a signee enters a situation where Alabama could definitely use some help, could definitely use a vertical stretch guy if if they get it. Um, Didn't see a whole lot of him on A-Day, although he flashed really late at the Mm -hmm. very end of A-Day. I think he caught like four balls in a row uh, to put it in the end zone or or, – pretty much was the entire drive uh, uh, on the last touchdown of A-Day. It's been pretty quiet. I haven't heard a lot about what's going on with him so far in fall camp, Uh, but this is a wide receiving core that could use a little juice and, and, and Malik Benson, a guy who purportedly can bring it. Yeah, and Brock RTR here in our comments, he's asking a question associated with really Benson and the rest of those receivers about the drops and where are they coming from? And uh, yeah, in the spring, in A Day, what we saw was uh, drops from Burton and Isaiah Bond and uh, Kobe Prentice uh, in the in the in the spring game. But um, you know, we did we we have heard that Jermaine Burton seems to be doing some good things. Bond continues to work. Right now, I look at it as as that rotation as four guys. I feel like are right there at the top and. When I think of those four, I go Burton, Ja'Cory Brooks, Bond, and I think Kendrick Law 
you have to consider almost as a starter at this point. Because I think he's just going to be on the field. I think there's too much trust in him and there's too many different things he does well um, that they're going to keep him on the sideline. So then you get to Benson, who you said it in the spring, seemed like there was more talk about Malik, not as much so far in fall camp. That doesn't mean he can't help this football team considerably because he does possess those physical attributes that they can certainly use. Uh, it's just continuing to get up to speed and to perform with consistency. And right now, I think when you think about Benson, kind of at Kendrick Law, Shaz Preston's also probably in that mix. And then you get into Benson, and I think guys like Hale and uh, some of the, uh, the the freshmen, the true freshmen, are, are more on the other field, you know, more working with the three. So, you know, that's sort of what he's trying to navigate right now and and, and become the guy that sort of – uh, justifies that billing that he came to Tuscaloosa with. Yeah, the sense you get on Kendrick Law is, he, is he's more of a complete player as a wide receiver than some of these other guys as a blocker, um, route running maybe ahead of some others. Uh, so I, I agree with you. I, I think we're going to see a lot of Kendrick Law, certainly more than we did last season uh, this fall. Uh, but it's going to be mm-hmm. fun to see how that shakes out uh, next week in the second scrimmage and beyond the wide receiver core. You know, Corey Brooks, Jermaine Burton, their places, I think, are secure. Don't know that either one of them is going is to break out and be a megastar, but, but I think their, their places in the rotation are, are pretty tight and pretty set. Beyond that, it, it could get into a little bit of a shuffle, but I'd certainly I think Kendrick Law is one of the guys who's at the top of the mix beyond that. Yeah, and, I, uh, and I think for Benson, it's there's the good news is, is that they still don't have – in my opinion, a true elite number one guy right? or a number two. They, they, I think they've got some, some potentially really good top of the rotation guys in Burton and Brooks. Um, but if you can bring some of that true outside playmaking ability to this mix, there's still a place for a guy. Kendrick Law, you're right. Everything that you want a receiver to do, he does it. Guts, toughness, strong hands, um, you know, you love all that intangibles, uh, too, about Kendrick. But if you're truly elite, they, they, they still got a spot for you in that rotation. No doubt. That is going to do it for this edition of the Talking Tide podcast. A little early. We normally broadcast on Sunday nights. Decided to come a little bit earlier with this one. We'll definitely be back again next weekend to discuss the Crimson Tide's second and final scrimmage of fall camp until then for travis ryer the longtime senior analyst at bamaonline.com i'm chase goodbread the sports columnist with the tuscaloosa news and we'll talk to you then right here on talking tide